Welcome to Middlesex Moments, the news and information program produced by Middlesex Community College. I'm Steve Minkler, Academic Dean and Head of the College. As always, Middlesex Moments comes to you from the radio and television studios in the Center for New Media, located on the main campus of Middlesex Community College in Middletown. I'm really delighted today to have as my guest Dr. Carlos Ere, who is the T. Lawrenson Riggs Professor of History and Religious Studies at Yale University. Uh, thanks for joining me today, Carlos. Oh, thanks for uh, inviting me to be on the show. Wow. It's wonderful. Glad to have you. Yeah. Maybe tell, tell the audience a little more about w- what got you started in uh, the interest of religious history. Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's kind of um, a long attraction I, I had beginning in like sixth grade is mm-hmm. when I, I just um, fell in love with history. I was living in Miami, going to a um, really bad school and living in a really bad foster home. And there was a dinky little branch of the Miami Public Library, which was my refuge at night. I would always go there. And by the time I left that house, I had checked out every book in their history section. And they had even given me permission to check out books from the adult section. Mm-hmm. That's where, where the attraction began. But then uh, I decided when I was a sophomore in high school, I want to make history my career. And I want to make history and religion my, my specialty, both. And uh, I was very, very um, hard-headed. All the adults around me advised me not to do this. It was highly impractical. What was I doing throwing away my life? But I didn't listen to anyone. And I think the lesson is, and this is what I've told my own children, and I tell anybody who asks, is um, if you follow your heart as well as your mind for a career or profession, you can't go wrong, mm-hmm. right? Even if, uh, even if you end up without a job, <laughs> you know, you've, you, you've put yourself into something that you really love. Sure. And, that, and if you do it because you love it, it doesn't feel like work. As a matter of fact, it's, uh, it, it, it gives you great enjoyment. Why religion and history? You know, it's just, I think, the way one is born. Well, and I think your own uh, personal history uh, speaks a lot, perhaps, to, to the fact that you've lived through history and some of your stories about actually growing up in Cuba before the revolution and, and having to be airlifted to the United States as part of Operation Pedro Pan. I would think you, you draw a lot from that, av- having lived through history. You're not just reporting about it from a faraway vantage point. You were in it at the time. Yeah, and one of the reasons... Maybe the chief reason I decided to specialize on the Reformation period, right, is that I, I lived through, uh, w- once I, g- I got to study the Reformation, 16th century, I, I identified with so many of the things that happened five centuries ago. I could emotionally as well as intellectually link to that. And um, I gave a lecture once a very large conference where I was the keynote speaker. And I pointed out that it was a 16th century studies conference. Everybody's doing 16th century. And I say, I'm probably the only Reformation historian alive who has seen religious imagery smashed. And actually, that was what I, I began my career with, uh, was that subject, Protestant rejection of religious imagery and the destruction of religious imagery. But I saw it. I saw it happen. Having that personal link I think is um, one of the things that has made my writing different from other scholars who study the same period, the same things. We'll explore this a little bit more after a short break. You are listening to Middlesex Moments from Middlesex Community College. Please stay tuned for more. Welcome back to Middlesex Moments, coming to you from Middlesex Community College. This is Steve Minkler, together with my guest, Dr. Carlos Ere from Yale University. And we're talking about uh, Dr. Ere's work in both uh, personal memoir writing, but also his exploration of many topics in religious history. And just before the break, we were talking about your own personal background, having grown up as a young boy in Cuba before the revolution and, and coming to the United States. You memorialized this in your memoir, Waiting for Snow in Havana, which was published in 2003 um, and won the National Book Award in nonfiction. What was the motivation for you to record um, your, your memories of that time in your life? Yeah, well, it wasn't planned. 
It just happened because of a, a, a lot of coincidences. Let's call it a perfect storm. I was about to turn 50. My oldest son uh, was turning the same age I was when I left my family. Then along comes this little boy, Elian Gonzalez. Some people, if they're old enough, remember the news constantly every night. Uh, was filled with reports of this boy who would come uh, on a raft with his mother and everyone on the raft had drowned except for him and he ends up in Miami with his relatives but then the Castro regime starts to claim him because his father whom he had never ever lived with was saying I need my son back well I, I went crazy I went crazy with rage absolute rage because that was the same government that had prevented my father from leaving and is that because of that government making that claim that I never saw my father again so I tried to uh, alert the news media I wrote to all the major media news outlets saying you know we got to put the story in context it's not just my family but Castro regime has separated hundreds of thousands of families intentionally nobody listened to me I didn't even get one single acknowledgement for any of my letters, not one. And I was writing on my what I thought was my fancy Yale stationery mm -hmm. with my fancy title, uh, such and such professor, not one acknowledgement. So I went crazy and I thought, what can I do? Well, how can I make this context accessible to a large audience? And of course I thought of writing some academic book, but it, that thought only lasted maybe an hour. It just came to me. I'll just write about my experience. Because as a historian, I know that narrative is what grabs people. You, you can write uh, the most serious kind of uh, philosophical analysis of something. You're not going to get a large audience. But if you tell a story, and if you tell it well, you'll get an audience. What my instinct told me was, I should write a novel, not the story of my life. So I started a novel fiction, but after about an hour, I decided I don't have enough imagination to make stuff up, so I'll just I'll, I'll write about my life and pass it off as fiction. And that's how, when I sold, I sold the manuscript when it was done, I sold it as fiction. But my editor was very smart, and she figured out somewhere along the way that you know, this is not fiction. So it ended up published as my memoir. And all these terrible things that were part of my history that... I would not want anyone to know about were there on paper, and I couldn't take them out. So the, the book is full of unpleasant stuff that I wouldn't have put in if I had been writing a memoir rather than a novel. Gotcha. Well, and, you know, in many ways, some of the stories that you tell in the book are you know, typical boyhood stories hmm. that maybe many of us could write but you constantly reference to things like the day the world changed. And you really, you've lived two or three different lifetimes in, in your own mm -hmm. life um, and, and suddenly having to grow up when you came to the United States. Maybe talk a little about how that all happened. Ma many of our listeners may not be aware of Operation Pedro Pan. Yeah, well, it, it, you know, it didn't get covered in the news very much. So actually people who, who were there alive when this was happening between 1960 and 1962 not aware of its existence, but 14,000 Cuban children, about two-thirds boys and one-third girls, more or less, uh, between the ages of, um, the youngest, I think, was six, and the oldest, you couldn't leave after age 18, so um, mm. left. Our parents sent us to the United States by ourselves uh, because in Cuba, Children were already being sent to the Soviet Union and to its satellite states. And also, the government had taken over all the schools, and the schools were, were purely for indoctrination. So our parents um, could not conceive of the Castro regime lasting very long. And they sent us to the United States as a kind of a temporary stopgap measure. Nobody, nobody ever imagined that, you know, 60 years later, <laughs> right. the same regime would, would still be in power. But what happened was that uh, in October 1962, which all Americans remember as the missile crisis, when um, Fidel Castro had his nuclear missiles taken away by the Russians, he, he got really angry. 
and he wouldn't let anyone leave, including our parents. Mm -hmm. So our parents were trapped. And eventually, most of us who came were reunited with our parents. But in some cases, in my case, it took three and a half years to reunite with my mom. And I never saw my father again. I know, I know I was just talking to somebody with whom I shared a foster home. And uh, his parents didn't come until 1966. He spent four and a half years waiting for his parents. My goodness. This subject, I think, particularly resonates at this time in the year 2018 when what we're seeing on the southern border of this country. Yes. It's a different situation. It's kind of apples and oranges because our parents willingly sent us here. But you're talking apples and apples when it comes to the pain that families feel when they're separated. And especially the, the younger the child, one would think the worst. But I think my own experience, I think it's the older the child, the worse, because the, the little kids will adjust more quickly and carry less baggage with them. It's been my experience. But, of course, everyone is different. Sure. But it's painful. No, there's no getting around the fact that it's painful and awful, and it should never happen. Yeah. Well, and, and in reading that book, I think uh, you, you talk in many ways about dichotomies in life and, and how they are, you know, pain and pleasure are combined as are good and evil. Mm. And one of my readings of the book is it's a coming of age story, one for you and having to suddenly become an adult as when you leave the country, but it's a, a coming of age story for the country of Cuba. It was it became independent after the 1898 war between Spain and the United mm-hmm. States and it had its history up until Fidel but it had it's kind of coming of age, but in a in a bad way. So to, uh, yeah, my impression. Well. So 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 you and the country both kind of came of age at the same time, but in very different respects. Absolutely. And um, the thing is, uh, most people don't realize. Most Americans don't realize that change is not always good. <laughs> right. You can be in a really bad situation and hope for change. And yes, you get change, but it actually makes everything worse. Mm-hmm. That is the the coming of age that, that Cuba had in 1959, from which it has not recovered and probably will never recover. Not in my lifetime, anyway. Because right. uh, now, you know, I came here as a child, but now, now I'm an old geezer. For heaven's sakes, I'm 67, but I'm still a kid who remembers Cuba before this coming of age. Yes, and I keep thinking, who remembers the old Cuba? Only old people now. Only old people can remember. And, and when you came to the United States, where you said you were in foster homes, you, you did move around the country a little bit before you, your mother was able to rejoin you. Where, where did you live when you came to the U.S.? Well, the, um, the airlift was very well-organized chaos because the number of kids who came so quickly that we were very uh, difficult to, to, to kind of... Um, uh, arrange the logistics so they would they would send us to any place they could I was lucky enough and uh, to end up with a very nice family in Miami an American Jewish family they spoke no Spanish so I learned English and some Yiddish that I thought was English I lived with them for nine months but um, then they, they couldn't keep me because they had only taken me in for a few months they had a very small house and uh, they had just adopted two infants on top of taking me in. My mother was scheduled to leave November 7th, 1962. The door closed on October 26th. And that family just could not keep. So I ended up being sent temporarily to a foster home run by a Cuban couple where half the kids had already been in trouble with the law. And uh, back then they were called juvenile delinquents. Mm -hmm. It was a very bad foster home. An uncle of ours had arrived at the last minute, and that's the reason we didn't go to live with him directly instead of the juvenile delinquent home. We were only supposed to be there for like maybe a month, and then our uncle was supposed to take us in. But we fell through the cracks, and they forgot about us, and we ended up almost spending almost a year in that house. But eventually, we, we did end up being sent to live with our uncle in uh, central Illinois, Bloomington, Illinois, home of State Farm Insurance. Okay. That's what I remember. <laughs> Corn, 
it's in the Corn Belt, and, yep. and it's State Farm Insurance and Eureka Vacuum Cleaners. Okay. How he ended up there, that's a, that's a whole other story. Corn and vacuums. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll trace a little more of Dr. Carlos Ere's story after this quick break. You're listening to Middlesex Moments from Middlesex Community College. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Middlesex Moments, coming to you from Middlesex Community College. This is Steve Minkler and my guest, Dr. Carlos Ere of Yale University. And before the break, we were talking about your journey to the United States from Cuba, and we you later went to Chicago for school and then came to Connecticut. So what was your path from... Yeah, well, the path was uh, I lived with my uncle for two years, two months, and two days in mm -hmm. central Illinois. Then our mom came. And uh, she couldn't find work in Miami. The geniuses uh, who did the resettlement said to her, well, you know, you don't have English. You were a housewife in Cuba, so you don't have any skills. And um, you're, you're physically handicapped. So Chicago is the place for you because they have so many factories and so many immigrants working in the factories, you won't need English. <laughs> so she, they sent her to Chicago, and uh, that's where I... We, we got reunited. Things were tough because she couldn't find work, no matter what the resettlement people had told her. It was mm -hmm. very difficult. To, so um, I was told by a social worker uh, that what I had to do was stay in school because I wasn't 18. As soon as I turned 18, drop out of school. But that's three years down the road. So um, here's what you should do. You should um, go to school in the day and work full time at night to support your mother, which is what I did. So things were rough. Things mm -hmm. were really rough. So I went to high school and college in Chicago, working basically full-time and, and always working two jobs, one full-time, one part-time during the summer. And I had decided in high school that the, the, what I'm doing now is what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I, I think one of the reasons I was so uh, hard-headed not listening to advice not to do this is that it was the only part of my life then that was going well. Uh, I, I, I got, as one would say, positive feedback mm -hmm. right, from, from concentrating on, on these subjects. Next thing I know, you know, I'm done with college. Uh, I find out that in order to teach uh, at the university level, you need a PhD. I apply to PhD programs, and I, I get into Yale's PhD program. And I think I've been admitted to a master's program because the way it's been explained to me, you can't get a PhD without getting a master. Yeah. So I think I'm being uh, just uh, admitted to an MA program, and I get to Yale and I find out, oh my God, I'm in a doctoral program. And the first question my a potential advisor asked me is when I, w when I walked into his office was, so what are you gonna write your dissertation on? I didn't even know what a dissertation was. <laughs> I persevered, I got my PhD at, at Yale in 1979, so I. I was uh, living in Hamden uh, most of the time mm -hmm. from 1973 to 79. So this is, uh, now I came back in 1996. And when I add up all the years, I have lived the longest in Connecticut than anywhere else okay. in my entire life. So now I guess I'm, uh, uh, what do you call you're, somebody you're, from uh, Connecticut? Yeah, a Connecticut or, or a nutmegger? A nutmegger, nutmegger, a yes, nutmegger. Yeah. I guess yeah, I'm yeah, a yeah. nutmegger. Uh, just through math. Okay. My yeah. Idea, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're very happy and proud to have yeah. you among us uh, oh. here in Connecticut. So, so you've gone from student to professor. What, are you, what are, kind of trends have you seen in the classroom? I think uh, we talked earlier about your own personal memoir being a way of telling your story. But I think as a historian, I've talked to our own Middlesex professor, Victor Trier, about you really need to be a good storyteller to, to get across your... Uh, what you're trying to accomplish in a classroom, and, and what kind of effect do you see yourself having on your students? When it comes to history, yes, uh, that's what I try to do when I teach. I try to uh, narrate, to tell story, and, and explain the connections between past, present, and future. But the greatest change I, I have seen in my f almost 40 years of teaching is, of course, affected by technological advances. Mm -hmm. And uh, the students expect digital, electronic access to the information. And you, I spend a lot of time uh, actually, you know, uh, making sure that things are available on the course website. My teaching has changed tremendously. Sure. Uh, and now I, I no longer use 
lecture notes. I, I do PowerPoint. And that's what the students expect. That's what they want. If, if I were to, now, 40 years later, right, after I started teaching, if I were to get into a class with my written lecture notes and just lecture, they'd probably throw rotten fruit at me or chase me out of the classroom mm -hmm. because that is not acceptable anymore. Yeah. I think um, what has happened in, in history now, uh, for instance, my field, uh, 16th, 17th century history, is no longer uh, considered essential. Mm -hmm. um, it used to be. It mm -hmm. used to be that uh, even a small college, even I, I saw it back then, even two-year community colleges would have a history course on the Reformation or mm -hmm. the Renaissance. You can't find that now in most schools. Yeah. Uh, so um, my period has now been devalued. The only, the only segment of my time period that now has a high value is the colonization, the transatlantic uh, connections between Europe and the New World. That's, that's, that's increasing in importance. But what happened in Europe between 1500 and 1700 that's no longer considered by most schools to be all that significant or necessary to, to have courses in. Do you think that, is that linked at all to sort of the devaluation of religion in our society, in our culture here? That's definitely part of it because, you know, this was a period of immense religious change. Yeah. But the Middle Ages, entire uh, millennium, thousand years, mm -hmm. uh, is also no longer uh, as valued as it used to be, and that's the, that's the time when religion was part of everything in Western history. So those two things do go together. The secularization uh, affects what is important. So you've written both in memoir form, but of course also in scholarly historical form. Are, are those two forms compatible at all? Uh, well, the writing is very different. You know, one of the historical writing uh, requires research longer. My, 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 the, my most recent book, which was published last year, Reformations, took me 17 years to write, on and off. My two memoirs, the first one took me three months, the second one took me two months. But the subjects don't mix. The subjects, uh, I mean, the, the, the writing style is different. Sure. But in the memoirs, I think one reason that, uh, you know, I ended up with a successful memoir and ended up with a National Book Award is that I had learned how to tell a story as a historian. That doesn't change. That, 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 that translates very well from one type of writing to the other. Mixing the two subjects, uh, uh, I can't mix Cuba with Reformation era. Right. Only if I talk about the destruction of images or if I talk, for instance, in uh, Geneva, under John Calvin, they spied on everyone. The, 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 the church and state were one and the same, and uh, they spied on people and brought people to trial for, for minor infractions, like for instance, naming your dog Calvin, or um, in, in many cases, for giving your child the wrong name. Mm -hmm. They actually had a list of names you could give your children, and, and people got in trouble for not doing that. Or for women, if they wore shoes that showed any part of their toes. And it's just like Cuba. It's just like the East, East German Stasi and, and the, the life anywhere in the Soviet Union and, and, and its satellites where you're constantly watched. I can link those two, but that'll take maybe one lecture. Sure. And you're done. That's it. If you could see your father today, if he were to suddenly appear, what would you tell him? Oh, gosh, that's a, that's a great question. I would say, look, look what you did to me. <laughs> <laughs> he loved history. He loved the past, right? I think um, it's either genetic or just passed on, you know, bring someone up for 11 years uh, with, with the past constantly present, mm -hmm. as was the case in our house. Mm -hmm. My father loved the past. He loved history. Uh, so I'd say, uh, in the same way my son jokes with me, because he wants to be a historian, uh, thanks, Dad. <laughs> 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 then I, you're kind of being ironic, but you're also being genuinely thankful. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for uh, you know, instilling this, this love of the past in me. Well, in, uh, in your book, uh, Waiting for Snow in Havana, you, you s refer to your parents as Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. A lot of historical imagery throughout the book. 
and you say that your father uh, focused on the past, rarely on the present, but never on the future. That's right. And your mother focused on the future. Yes. Um, so before she passed on, what was her vision for your future and that of your family? Well, um, my mom uh, actually got advice from her friends not to allow me to go for a PhD because I was throwing away my talents and my life doing something so useless. And she told them all to go to hell, basically. Mm-hmm. So she, she, was, she was proud of what I did. And um, she just hoped I had picked a profession that would have been maybe a little more lucrative as all parents uh, wor- worry about that aspect of their, their kids' lives. Yeah. But what was funny, was one, one anecdote, something that was very funny is, her friends actually ran an, uh, like an intervention, intervention session. They surprised her. They all ganged up on her to tell her that, that she shouldn't allow me to, to go for the PhD. The very same group of friends, when I, f- I did get my master's degree on my way to the PhD, they all wrote me a letter and they all signed it. Very nice. Congratulations. Yeah. And probably behind my back and my mom's back, they're saying, this kid's wasting his life. <laughs> but uh, they were proud of me. No doubt they should be. And uh, Dr. Carlos Airy, it's been a, a privilege and a pleasure to have you uh, with us today on Middlesex Moments. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Well, it's great to be here. Thank you. And thank you. So, and thank you all for listening to another edition of Middlesex Moments. So for everyone here at Middlesex Community College, I'm Steve Minkler, and we hope to see you again soon.